We've talked about the structure of the brain. We've talked about where processes are occurring in the brain and how we can figure that out by measuring blood flow. And now I want to talk about how processes are occurring in the brain and how we can figure this out by measuring brain activity a little more directly by measuring the electrical activity between neurons. I want to talk about EEG, electrophysiology. So remember, hemodynamics measure blood flow. They measure the energy that's required to power our brain activity. But electrophysiology measures the electrical activity of the neurons themselves. Every time our neurons fire, they're sending electrical signals to each other. And we can measure that by putting electrodes directly onto a person's head or by measuring the magnetic fields generated by that electrical activity. And in that sense, we're measuring the work that the brain is doing as it is being done. Remember those trade-offs. fMRI has really good spatial resolution, but very terrible temporal resolution. EEG is almost the exact inverse. It has great temporal resolution because it's taking a sample of our brain's electrical activity thousands of times a second. But it has really terrible spatial resolution. In fact, with conventional EEG, when we put electrodes onto a person's scalp, we really can't say where the brain activity we're measuring originates from. We don't know where that brain activity is happening in the brain. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, if we can't tell where it's coming from, why would we even want to do it? Like, what good is this? And I hope I can make the case that it's actually a really useful method for asking very specific kinds of questions. Yes, we can't really tell you where something is happening in the brain, but we might be able to tell you what kind of process is happening. We may be, even be able to tell what specific steps the brain is taking to do certain kinds of computations. And I think that that's really valuable. Okay, what is EEG? EEG is a way of measuring electrical activity produced by the brain using electrodes. This was first applied to human brains in 1929 by a physician named Hans Berger. And what EEG does is it measures electrical potentials. So all you really need for this to work is you need a bunch of electrodes that you can put onto a person's head. You need an amplifier to amplify the signal because as it turns out, the electrical activity generated by our neurons is very weak. And you need some way of recording it, usually onto a computer. Although in the old days, I think they used to do it on paper, which seems crazy to me. Why should we want to use EEG? I think it's easy for people to see why fMRI is cool. Well, everyone's really interested in where things are happening in our brains. And if you can say, oh, here's the language part, and here's the visual word form area, and here's the fusiform face area, doesn't require a lot of explanation for why we should care about that kind of research. But EEG is a little bit harder to sell. Why should we care about EEG? It can't tell us anything really about what's happening in the brain. Like we can't see where things are happening. It can't tell us really anything about functional specialization. But it does something else that I think is really interesting. It lets us see how cognitive processes unfold in real time. Remember, it has really good temporal resolution. So it's really good for asking questions that have to do with time or stages of processing. It also is very good for telling us certain things about covert processes. This is something that fMRI can't really do, or at least can't do in the same way. EEG can tell us if someone is having a brain response to something that they're not actually aware of. That can be really useful to us. It can tell us about certain kinds of covert processes. EEG lets us test hypotheses about competing algorithms. Maybe there's a certain process that has a few different models that might explain how that process is algorithmically performed. EEG might be a way for us to tell which of those two algorithms is more likely to be the one that is executed by our brains. So which of Mars levels does this sound like? This sounds pretty algorithmic, right? In a way, we're sort of bridging that gap between the computational algorithmic and implementational levels. It's sort of implementational because we know that it's happening in the brain. Although we don't know exactly where it's happening, we don't know exactly how. We know that it has something to do with neurons firing. But we're using what we know about the implementational level. We're using the fact that we know that it involves neural firing to try to figure something out at the algorithmic level. We're going to try to figure out how the brain is representing things. 
we're going to try to figure out what kinds of processes the brain is using to do computations. So we're going to stay at that algorithmic level. We're going to talk about the types of representations that the mind creates. And we're going to talk about the types of operations that the mind performs over those representations. And we're going to use what we know about the brain, making observations from neural activity itself to try to answer those questions. When we do EEG, first we have to measure a participant's head. That way we get a good fit on the net. That net is going to be placed directly onto the scalp where the electrodes come into contact with our skin. And we're going to be measuring the brain activity generated by the neurons that are firing inside the brain. When those neurons fire, they send electrical activity across the synapse to other neurons that they are connected to. That electrical activity filters all the way up outside of our brains, through our skull, through our skin, through our hair, into the electrodes. It's kind of a miracle that this actually works because it's a very weak electrical signal. And I'm always kind of amazed that it actually survives that distance. But it totally works. And part of the reason that it works is that we amplify that signal tremendously. We have to amplify the hell out of it to try to get it to a point where we can actually see it because it's a, such a weak signal. And part of this process involves reducing the amount of resistance, electrical resistance, between the electrode and the brain itself. And some of that we can't do anything about, can't really change the amount of resistance that's imposed by a person's skull. But we can try to reduce the resistance at least between the skin and the electrode. And we can watch the brain waves come in in real time. That's part of the fun of doing EEG experiments, I think. There's something you really don't get with fMRI. You can't watch the brain activity unfold in real time. But when we sit in the lab, when we're doing these experiments, we can actually see a person's brain activity unfolding right before our eyes. I think that's really cool. Neurons actually fire two different kinds of electrical signals. They have action potentials. Those are internal to the neuron. They occur within a neuron. And they're very, very fast, something on the order of a single millisecond. Of course, that's not something we can really measure. It's inside the neuron. We don't have a way of getting inside a neuron to measure that electrical potential. Definitely can't measure it from the outside of the head. But there's another kind of electrical potential, the postsynaptic potential. That's an electrical potential that occurs between neurons, from a neuron to another connected neuron. This is a bit slower, somewhere on the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds. And that postsynaptic potential, that's what sort of bleeds out of the brain through the head and into the electrodes. That's a thing that we can measure. That postsynaptic potential generates a dipole and a magnetic field. If enough of these are summed together, then we can measure them. So this actually requires a lot of neurons to fire synchronously. It requires a lot of neurons to fire at the same time. That's the only way that we can actually get enough of a signal to measure it. And of course, the skull kind of interferes with this electrical transmission, but it's not such an issue for magnetic field transmission. This is one of the advantages of MEG, of magnetic encephalography. When you measure the magnetic fields generated by this brain activity, you don't have the issue of resistance. Magnetic field permeates through a human skull just fine. So EEG is measuring postsynaptic potentials. And really, it's only measuring actually with a depth of about 5 millimeters. That sounds like a really big limitation. We can only go down 5 millimeters into the brain to get that activity. Um, but if you remember from the first lecture about neuroscience, when we talked about the geography of the brain, most of the functionality we're interested in is happening in the very thin outer layer of the cortex. So maybe it's not such a big deal that we only have a penetrating depth of 5 millimeters since most of what we're interested in happens at that depth anyways. And in that layer, we have vertically oriented pyramidal neurons. And if enough of those pyramidal neurons fire in synchrony, that creates a signal with a strength that we can actually measure and observe. And that is fundamentally what the EEG is measuring. It's measuring the coordinated synchronized firing of those upward pointing pyramidal neurons. Now, just like with fMRI, we always wanted to have some kind of baseline comparison. It's similar for EEG. We don't just want to measure global brain activity because there's activity happening all the time. And in fact, there's activity happening related to all kinds of bodily processes, lots of mundane stuff that we're not very interested in. So what we want to do is we don't just want to measure EEG. We want to measure something called an event-related potential. We want to measure what is the specific brain response to a specific kind of process usually something that is elicited by a specific kind of stimulus.
So what we do is we do this lots and lots of times, just like we would do for fMRI. You get lots and lots of trials, average all of those together, and then that gives you a clear picture of what that brain response looks like. Now in fMRIs, the average brain response was a voxel by voxel three-dimensional picture of the blood flow. With EEG, the average brain response looks like a waveform. It looked like um, some kind of sine wave. So there are very specific kinds of brain responses associated with specific kinds of processes that have very specific kinds of waveforms associated with them. So we can actually identify brain responses based on how the waveform looks. And we can have specific kinds of waveforms that correlate with specific kinds of brain activity. Okay, but how do we actually identify these brain responses? What's in play? If you think about the waveform, what are the characteristics of the waveform that we can use to identify different kinds of brain responses? Well, we've got amplitude. How high and low are the waves? We've got uh, latency. If we're looking at a peak, what's the timing of the peak? How long after the onset of the stimulus do we see that peak? We've got polarity. Is it a positive peak or a negative peak? And we have scalp location. Now, of course, we can't tell exactly where this is happening in the brain, but we can still observe where we measured it at the scalp. Sometimes we measure a positive peak 300 milliseconds after the onset of a stimulus in the center of the brain. Sometimes we measure a negative peak 600 milliseconds after the onset in the posterior of the brain. These are all the different factors that we can use to identify specific kinds of brain responses that we think index different kinds of underlying cognitive processes. Now it's time for the part of the lecture that I call Speech Perception Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. Here's a question. How does our brain encode speech sounds? So we talked a lot about speech sounds when we talked about speech perception, right? We talked about how speech sounds exist on a continuum, and yet we seem to perceive them as distinct categories. And there has to be some kind of like mapping between the continuous physical spectrum and the discrete categories that we recognize in our minds. Well, here's a question. Do we encode the sounds in a continuous way or do we encode them as categories? This was an open question for a long time. People weren't sure how deep categorical perception went. Joe Toscano has an EEG lab at Villanova University where he collects the cleanest EEG data that anyone has ever seen. And he did a really influential study on speech perception where he found that there is a correlation between the amplitude of the brain response measured with EEG and the physical description of the sound that a person is hearing. So we can look at that spectrum between D and T and we can see that spectrum laid out in these rainbow colors where the sound that is closest to D, it's on the D side of the spectrum, has the lowest amplitude brain response and the sound that is the furthest on the T side of the spectrum has the highest amplitude brain response. And there is a perfect linear correlation between where a sound is on that spectrum, on that continuum, and what the amplitude of the brain response is. What this tells us is it tells us that the brain is encoding the analog or continuous nature of those sounds, the physical description of those sounds, before it converts them into discrete categories. In my own research, we wound up accidentally finding this exact same effect when we were looking for something else entirely. So this idea that speech sounds are encoded by the auditory system in this gradient way, this continuous way. This turns out to be pretty pervasive. We were trying to measure something else entirely and we wound up measuring this effect by accident. And we measured it in sort of a different range than the original study. So that was pretty cool. And we measured it in a different context, a context where people weren't paying any attention to the sounds at all. There was no attention being given. So it's nice to see that this effect holds up. This seems to be a pretty basic way that our auditory system encodes continuous sounds. First they're encoded in a continuous way, and then later they're mapped to those discrete categories. <laughs> 
So already we can see EEG is giving us access to something we don't really have conscious access to, and it's telling us something about how we form mental representations. It's telling us how we encode sensory information. But it can tell us even more about mental representation because we can start asking questions about prediction. Our brains are continuous prediction generating machines. We talked a lot about top-down processing. Well, a lot of top-down processing that our brain does involves prediction. We are always predicting what we think the next thing that we are going to experience is going to be. We are predicting all of our sensory inputs. And this is true in the domain of sound. So we have a very specific kind of brain response, an ERP response, that is associated with prediction error. When your brain predicts something, and that prediction fails, it's wrong. This is sort of like the back propagation that we talked about in recurrent networks, if you remember when we talked about artificial neural networks, when we talked about connectionism. Recurrent networks will feed a signal forward, and then they will compare it to an output, and then they will generate an error signal that propagates backwards through the network. Well, we think that something very similar is happening in the human brain, and this is a process that we can measure using EEG. We can measure an ERP called the mismatch negativity. It's an index of auditory surprise or auditory prediction error. And it's generally thought to be pre-attentive. It doesn't require any attention. Um, it's very automatic. So this is actually a test that can be performed on comatose patients to find out if their brain is still working, if they're still operating over sensory information. The way this paradigm works is we repeat a sound over and over. And the more we repeat it, the more the brain is going to predict that it will hear that same sound again. Well, I've already heard that sound five times, six times, seven times. It's a pretty good bet that I'm going to hear it one more time. So it's causing the brain to create a very specific kind of prediction. And it turns out there are lots of interesting questions that we can ask about what exactly the brain chooses to predict in response to what kinds of input. So something that interested me was how detailed of a prediction will the brain make in response to sounds that are all a little bit different from each other. Remember, those speech sounds come from a continuum. There isn't just a D and a T in the wild in the physical terms. In physical terms, D and T come from a continuum. So you can sample sounds from all over that continuum, and you can play them repeatedly to see if the brain is going to be surprised or not, whether there will be a prediction error. You can see what kinds of predictions the brain is making. What I've found so far is that the brain doesn't seem to care at all about these little differences in the continuous representation. It only seems to care about the categories. It only seems to care about whether a sound is a D or a T. It doesn't really care if you have a bunch of different Ds and then you get a really different D. As long as they're all Ds, that's not really surprising. The only thing the brain seems to care about is if you get a bunch of different Ds and then a T. The brain just doesn't seem to care. It only cares about categories. That's really interesting because that tells us something about how the brain chooses to represent the sounds that it's hearing, at least in this context. So even though the brain is encoding those sounds in a continuous way, it's not using that continuous information to make predictions. It's only using the category information to make predictions. That's kind of interesting. All right, I want to talk about one more thing that we can use EEG to measure. And this has to do with learning. So I said in the last lecture, I really love experiments where you teach people fake languages. That's true. I think they're super fun. So one thing we're interested in is the difference between implicit and explicit learning. When you learn something, there's some kind of physical change that has to happen in your brain. Remember, we talked about plasticity. Well, this is sort of like micro level plasticity. Every time you learn something, there's some kind of physical change happening in your brain. That's just sort of a natural consequence of everything that happens in our minds having some kind of physical cause in our brain. If something changes in our minds, something has to change in our brain. So every time you learn something, there's some kind of physical change or physical commitment that's being made in your brain, in your neural structure. And something that interested us was the question of whether implicit and explicit learning lead to different kinds of neural changes.
implicit and explicit learning are very different from each other. Implicit learning is very effortless. It's very unconscious. It tends to be very gradual. It's a type of learning that doesn't involve feedback. It's a type of learning that only uses positive examples. Whereas explicit learning tends to be more rule-based, more effortful, tends to be more conscious. It tends to be more abrupt. You can tell someone a rule and then they will just know how to use it right away. It doesn't have to be gradual. And you can give people feedback when you're doing explicit learning. You can get both positive and negative examples. This is exactly the kind of feedback that you don't get when you're learning a language as a baby, right? Babies do all of their learning implicitly. So this actually has a lot to bear on the way that we learn languages, not just as children, but also as adults. Would it be better for us to replicate the language learning situation that babies experience in order to learn a second language as adults? Or is it faster and better for us to just do explicit learning? Just have someone tell you what the rules are so you can use them. It's definitely faster. But the question is whether they lead to the same kind of neural changes. So let's just run through a little demo of what this looked like for our participants. I'm going to play some words, and I just want you to tell me if you notice a pattern. Shusha, sise, sosu, shesho, sasi. Do you notice anything? Is there a regularity here? Is there a pattern? Well, actually, we saw this pattern before in the lecture on linguistic structure. This is the phonological rule for chumash. This is the rule that says a word can have an S or it can have an SH, it can have a SH, but it can't have both. A word cannot have S and SH. This is that sibilant harmony pattern that Chumash and Navajo both have that's otherwise very rare among world languages. And this is a potentially long distance pattern, right? We had that word Shtoyo no Wono Wash, where the two S's are very far apart from each other, but they still have to agree with each other. So this is not a pattern that English speakers are likely to be familiar with. It only exists in a few languages, and these are languages that most English speakers don't have a lot of contact with. So this presents a good learning opportunity. If we teach this pattern to participants in the lab, what kinds of changes will we see in terms of their brain response? So we had two groups of participants. One group learned the rule explicitly. We would go into the lab before they would be tested and we would just tell them what the rule was. We say, hey, you're going to go in there, you're going to hear a bunch of words. Here's the pattern. The pattern is all of the words have to have either an S or an S, but not both. Can't have both S and S in the same word. Got it? Yeah, okay, great. Then you can go in, you know the rule right away. And so you can go right into the experiment knowing exactly what you should do. But we had another group where we didn't tell them what the rule was. We just said, hey, you're going to hear a bunch of words and there's some kind of pattern. I need you to figure out what that pattern is. We're not going to tell you what it is. You have to figure it out yourself. The way this experiment worked, first they would have a training session. They would hear words and have to repeat them out loud. We thought this would help them learn the rule. After that training session, they would have a testing session. During the testing session, they would hear new words, words they didn't hear before in the training session, and they have to say whether those rules followed the pattern that they heard earlier or not. And during this training session, we were measuring their brain responses because we wanted to see what the brain response would look like to words that violated the rule. There are certain kinds of brain responses that we expect if a person knows a rule and they know a pattern, there are a certain kind of brain response that you get if a pattern is violated. So we expected to see those patterns. We wanted to see if it mattered whether you were taught the rule explicitly or implicitly. The first thing we noticed during testing was the group that had been explicitly told the rule did way, way better at judging which words were good and bad, which words followed the rule and which ones didn't follow the rule. You can see their accuracy is almost three times as high as the implicit learning participants. The implicit learning participants, they still seem to learn the rule okay, but they definitely weren't anywhere near as accurate as the group that learned the rule explicitly, the group that was just told. But of course, we're not just interested in accuracy, we're also interested in brain responses. We want to know how the brain changed in response to having learned this rule. Now, there are two kinds of brain responses that we expected in this experiment. We expected a response called a P300. That's a positive wave that peaks 300 milliseconds after the stimulus. 
And we expected this because this is associated with categorization. When people are doing this kind of task where they have to categorize something as good or bad or grammatical or ungrammatical, usually we see a P300 brain response. We also expected a brain response called the LPC. This is something a little bit newer that we've only been seeing in the last six years or so from similar studies. The LPC is a much later brain response, peaks like 600 milliseconds after the stimulus, and it's positive, and it's generally associated with linguistic processing, with native language processing. Something that we've seen in similar studies is that when people internalize rules, even if they've learned them for the first time, they get this brain response that is the same kind of brain response that people get to violations in their native language. So if we see this kind of brain response, it tells us that they've really internalized the rule. They're processing it the same way they would process their own native language. So that's a really great indicator that they have learned the rule in a very deep kind of way. Okay, what do we actually see in the brain responses? Well, for the implicit learning group, the group that didn't have that high accuracy, we see we get the expected P300, of course, because they're doing categorization. We also get the LPC, that brain response that's associated with native language processing. That's really cool because it means even though their accuracy wasn't that high, they did still internalize this rule and they are treating it in the same way they treat the rules of their own native language. They've really learned it. When we look at the explicit group, we don't see any kind of brain response. They don't even have the categorization response. That was really surprising to us. We still don't know exactly why we don't see that categorization response. The fact that we don't see an LPC means that even though they learn the rule and even though their accuracy is very high, they're still not processing it the same way that they would process a rule in their native language. They're treating it very differently. I think that this makes a lot of sense. They were told the rule explicitly. They were given sort of a cheat. They were given like a workaround. They don't have to figure out the rule for themselves. They don't have to process it the same way that they process the rules they learned as babies. They can just say, oh wait, I know that a word is not supposed to have an S and an S. Okay, I'm just going to apply that rule using whatever domain general cognitive mechanisms I have that I can use. I don't have to bother using my language center. I don't have to bother using all that machinery I have in place for learning and using languages. I can just use whatever domain general stuff I need to do to get through this next hour so I can get my 20 bucks and get out of here. <laughs> so even though the explicit group learned the pattern and had very high accuracy, they don't seem to have any discernible brain response to the violation, at least nothing that we expect. Whereas the implicit group, even though they didn't learn the rule all that well, their uh, accuracy wasn't that high, they get exactly the kind of brain responses that we expect and exactly the kind of brain responses that we typically see with natural languages, with people's native languages. We still don't know exactly why this disparity exists, but we think that there might be something interesting here that tells us about what might be the better way for us to learn languages as adults? Maybe explicit learning doesn't have the kind of long-term gain that we want. Maybe it's a very effective short-term solution, but we would need to do some kind of follow-up testing to see whether that knowledge persists over time. My assumption is that given they don't have the right kinds of brain responses, it seems they didn't really internalize the rule and they probably won't be able to remember it for very long. So even though explicit learning may be very useful, it's probably not the best way to engage neuroplasticity. It's not the best way to create a novel kind of neural structure that will deeply embed that knowledge. So I think EEG is really cool. Obviously I'm an EEG advocate. And I think EEG can answer really interesting questions about things like perception, decision-making, stages of processing, mental representation, algorithms. It's answering very different kinds of questions than what something like fMRI would answer. It's not telling us where things happen in the brain, but it is telling us maybe what kinds of things happen in the brain. And it can also tell us when those things happen, what the stages are, how do we encode sensory information? How do we convert that encoding into a specific kind of mental representation? How does our brain structure change in response to learning novel patterns? These are all really interesting questions to me. So that's why I, I love EEG. I've always loved it. I'll, <laughs> I'll always advocate for it. <laughs> Let's talk about the key concepts from this lecture. I talked a lot about electroencephalography, EEGs, and specifically we've talked about ERPs, event-related potentials, a way of extracting brain responses to specific kinds of stimuli that we can correlate 
with specific processes, specific algorithms. And remember that electroencephalography, EEG, is measuring postsynaptic potentials. It's measuring a specific kind of electrical activity in the brain, the activity between neurons. EEG is a good way of measuring covert processes. It's also a good way of measuring stages of processing, things related to time. And it's a good way of accessing algorithms and mental representations. I talk specifically about certain findings in the realm of speech perception, like the neural encoding of speech sounds, and how our brain changes in response to implicit and explicit learning.